Do we have any like uh, people in the room that like when garage sale comes around, you get excited like Christmas comes around? Anybody? Yeah, don't be don't be bashful. It's yeah. I am a garage sale fiend. I love garage sales. And I'm always blown away at garage sales for two reasons. One of the reasons is what people will buy. I'm like, what, what really? You're buying that? Uh, and then I guess the other thing is what people will buy from me. I'm like, you really want that? Like, have you ever walked up to those garage sales where they have the cushions with the cat food still stuck on it and they want like 20 bucks for it? But it means something to them, so it's worth more. No? You guys told me you'd be more rowdy than 9.30. Come on. Oh, my goodness. Do we have to get Dallas back up making meat carrots again? No? Okay. Because we'll pull it. We will. We'll bring it up. Um, the other thing about garage sales is, like, when you show up and you, it's, first of all, it's, number one, it's awkward walking onto people's property going to buy their personal belongings. It's just, there's something about it. Nobody does it confidently. Everyone's like, uh, okay. And then it's even worse when you walk away and you didn't buy anything. You're like, your stuff isn't worth anything. <laughs> It's not really what you're saying, but that's, that's how I feel anyways, but I'm a nine. Um, but I always wonder, it, it takes me back to a commercial I saw when I was younger, and it was a commercial of a grandpa or a dad, he looked old, a grandpa or a dad standing out on the driveway with the garage door closed with their child, and as the garage door slowly opens, the, the dad leans over, it's like, one day this could all be yours. And some of you are thinking about your garage right now, <laughs> you're like... But that's, that's the idea of it. Is, and when I think about that, I think of the word legacy. Because, let's be truthful, in the garage, there's a lot of really good things. Like, there's finished projects, some stuff is in order. Like, for our, like our garage, there's three quarters of it is all just Christmas. It's just Christmas stuff. Um, and in other garages, however, there's unfinished products, projects. There's, there's broken glass. There's things that have use in one season, but don't have, have use in another. There's broken pieces of wood that are shoved, and it's like, well, are you one of those, dads, raise your hand, are you one of those that it's like, well, we might need it someday, so we're just going to tuck it in this old coffee jar. Okay, yeah. A thousand nuts and bolts, right? But I want you today, as, as we talk, I want you to think of your, of your garage as, as, as your legacy, and what you're leaving behind. And when that garage door opens, is it just a conglomerate of garbage and all the good thing is really hidden in the back? Or is it, is it organized? Is it set apart? Is it intentionally ready to be passed on? Is that okay? Can I take you there today? You can track with me. Be vocal, please. Let's talk, let's communicate, let's participate. This is going to be good. I want to take you guys on a journey because we see this beautiful handoff happen between King David and his son Solomon. And King David is nearing the end of his life. And his son Solomon is really young when he comes into, into ruling. He's, he's in his teens, super young. But King David is trying to set Solomon up the best that he can. So uh, as we go through scriptures today, I want you to follow along with me. we got some reading to do, but if you'll stay awake with me, like 9.30, I get it, you're not awake yet, but 11.15, you'd have some time. So let, let's, let's do this. And as we go through this, I want you to think about your legacy. And I'm not just talking to fathers. We can, we can broad span this over, over anybody that is leaving something to, to the next generation coming up. Because as much as a parent, we want to... We want to hand down the good, but we want to bypass the bad. It's like, here's the good things I'm going to teach you, son, but we get to the point where we don't want to be vulnerable enough to show the lessons that we've learned or the scars that we carry. And so a lot of times, we'll set our children up really, really well with practical things, but we bypass the stuff that we struggled with and may have overcome, maybe not, but we don't, we don't allow that side to open up. And the truth is, is that when we're willing as a parent to open up that side of us, it lets our kids see us in a different perspective. It helps them to see us human. Reg like, not regular, but just human, the humanity of us. And as Father's Day approaches, you know, and the tattoos and, and, and muscle men and everything like that, I could never be a muscle man. I tried putting on muscle. It doesn't stay on me. It's not because I don't want it. I want it. But I can't, 
It just doesn't build. And I'm okay with that. I've, I've, I've come to terms with it. But the longer that we portray fatherhood as this giant buff, Mr. Clean the Rock security guard, protector of all, protecting important, but if we only leave it for that strength to be for status and not for service, then we do our kids a disservice. So if it's only about being big and tough and brute and not, not ever showing the human side of you, then our kids will grow up not being able to tap in to that emotional side of them. And what will happen is they will do their kids a disservice and it just continues on and trickles down through generation to generation. So today, fathers, men, young men and old, I'm going to challenge you today. You may say, well, what are you doing like up there? And honestly, that's the first thought I had to come to mind when it came to Father's Day and I found out I was speaking. It's like, what right do I have to speak, speak to full-grown men that have had many children? You know, we're in Mennonite country. I've got two kids. You probably have 6,000. <laughs> and you know that scripture where it says, be fruitful and multiply? You guys took that one way further than I would have taken it. <laughs> But, you know, to each their grace and their lot. I've got grace for two. You've got grace for a lot. Okay? So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But follow with me. And, and, and if you would mind, while we go through this, I want you to do an introspection of your heart. Not just men, parents. But do, an, do, do a little bit of a surgery because we're going to get to the place, I hope today, where men, we see our lives as we've gone through some things, We've learned some things. We have some things to offer. The next coming up. So follow track with me. Here we go. We go in First Chronicles 28, verse 2 to 3. It says this, and David is standing before, it is King David nearing the end of his life. So he has many people around him. He's in the temple, and he's got everybody gathered because he was, he's making sure people know that he wants to set his son up well going into this. It says, then King David rose to his feet and said, hear me, my brethren and my people. I have had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the footstool of our God and had made preparations to build it. But God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war. I'm going to stop right there. This, this always, this, when I read this, it triggers me because uh, when we look through David's life, like he was a warrior, he fought, he hid, he fought, he fit, hid, he fought. And when he faced Goliath at a young age, the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, you know, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of my God. And so all the while I'm thinking that David and God are good with the whole fighting thing. You know what I'm saying? Like God's on, on, on this, but in the end of his life, God's like, because you've been a man of war, I can't let you build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant. So what's happening here is God has told David I need, like, uh, here's the plans for the temple that I want built to house the Ark of the Covenant, which is where God's Spirit resided. David is now taking those plans and he's bestowing it upon his son Solomon. Raise your hand if you're tracking with me. Oh, man, I got to do better at this. Okay. Wow. Let's go to First Chronicles. Reading on, 5 to 6. And all of my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons. This is David. He has many, many sons. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Now he said to me, it is your son Solomon who shall build my house, my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. So take a picture of what's happening here is that David's near the end of his life. God's been with David his whole life. David had a heart after God. Now, because his, the end of his life is near, God is saying, you may pass on, but I'm taking Solomon to be my son, and I will be his father. For anybody sitting in here today that did not grow up without a father, you are not without a father. You are not without a father. Hold that thought. And we're going to read on. We're going to jump to 1 Kings because the story continues in 1 Kings, and, it, and it, it's just a different perspective. So this is, um, let's read it along. Now Haram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. So Haram, for Haram had always loved David. Then Solomon sent to Haram saying, you know my, how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. 
but now the Lord has given me rest. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. So this is Solomon talking now, and he's saying, because my dad, because my father fought wars on every side of him, I now have no wars fought against me, and I have no evil occurrence, no adversaries. Fathers, do you understand that the battles that you choose to fight now, your children will not need to fight? The things that you have the guts to sacrifice for and to put blood, sweat, and tears into right now, and the internal difficulties that you may struggle with or the temptations that you fight on a regular basis, if you take it upon yourself to fight those battles now, you will not see a repeat of that in your children. You won't. You won't. And I said I'm going to challenge you today. We're getting into this because I am, I've spent 15 years of my life doing youth ministry. And I watch the statistics of kids that grow up with fatherless homes or absent father, father homes or even in homes where fathers choose to prioritize other things apart from investing in their children. And the decline of what happens in our, in our society because of what happens that is crazy. It's crazy. We now have a generation that is growing up that don't know how to write a resume. They don't know their worth. They don't know their value. They don't understand their capacity level. And when things get hard, they back away and they shy out. That is not what we need. We need a generation that's growing up that is confident, courageous, willing, knowledgeable, willing to fight for the things that deserve fighting for. And fathers, if you choose to fight for it now, they will not need to when they grow up. <clears throat> and the inf- yeah, I'm going to leave that there. Love this. So we're in the, I love how this ties in with what we're, the series we're in too. Let's take our job back. So if we choose as a church to decide to fight for the things now, our children will not need to fight for them. But also, wouldn't it be a shame if we spent all of our days attending here on Sundays and throughout the week building the church that we want as opposed to the church our kids need? Making sure that we got our coffee. Making sure that our songs are sung. (laughs) You have no idea how many requests I get. Making sure that we're not preference driven when we show up here because we're not building your church or my church. We're building God's church. So let's not, like as fathers of the faith, let's not show up on Sunday and be like me, 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 me. It's like, no, no, no. What can I invest? What can I invest? What can I invest? What can I do to set the platform higher for my children when they take this room over from that room? When they transfer into here, have we done everything that we can to not build our favorite church, but to build God's church and open up the reins freely for them to take it to the next stage? Because God is always moving. God is always building. God is always looking forward, ahead. Amen? So David speaks to Solomon, and this is where David gets really, really good at being a father. I'm actually going to prop him up for this because he starts... With the spiritual side of things, let's look in First Chronicles 28, 9 to 10. He says, as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. This is a great bedtime story time with your son or daughter. <laughs> if you seek him, he'll be found by you. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Next, David goes to the practical. Follow. You guys are still with me. I love this. It's good. David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule. Its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, the inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers, of all around, of all the treasuries of the house of God, And of the treasuries for the dedicated things. Also for the division of the priests and the Levites, for all the work of the service of the house of the Lord and for all the articles of service in the house of the Lord. So David is gathering people together. He's like, David, or sorry, David is gathering everybody together and he's saying, Solomon, these are the people that are going to help you run the church services. Solomon, these are the people that are going to help you build this vestibule and you can build your palace. And I think as fathers, we do this so often is where we get so focused, like, man, I want my kids to be successful. So this is how you get a job. There you go. This is how you make money. There you go. Now you should be go, get a haircut and find a real job kind of thing and kick them out the door. But there's something deeper that David is missing here. 
He's setting them up for success, but it's not everything. Here are the divisions of the priests and the Levites for all the service of the house of God, and every willing craftsman will be with you for all manner of workmanship, for every kind of service. Also, the leaders and all the people will be completely at your command. I've given you the plans. I've given you the people. You should be good to go. But then he says this, and this is a, this is a great offering talk, by the way, if anybody ever uses it. First Chronicles 29.3 says, Furthermore, David says, because my heart is in this. It's my son. My heart is in this. In addition to beyond what I have gathered, I'm turning over my personal fortune of gold and silver from making this place of worship for my God. 3,000 talents, about 113 tons of gold, all from Ophir, the best, the 7,000 talents, 214 tons of silver for covering the walls, the buildings, and for the gold, and the silver from the craftsmen and the artisans. And now, how about you? He's turning to the temple, the people that he's ruled, and he's saying, how about you? Who will join me in the giving? You know when we do baby dedications up here, it's not just so that we bless the family and say goodbye after Sunday. It's actually a commitment that we're making as a church to stand by them and their children as those children grow up. It is a long-term commitment. And what David is doing here, he's like, who's going to join me in setting up my son successfully? Who's going to give? And rightfully so. He sets the example. He's saying, above what I've given, I'm taking everything that I've gathered and I'm putting in, I'm sacrificing something huge for his future. Would you join me in setting him up to rule Israel? And my challenge to us today is, would you join me, the church, in setting up our kids for success? It may cost you something. It may cost a lot. It may hurt. It may take time. But isn't it worth it? Wouldn't it be worth it to see our, cha our city change because Parallel Church decided to take it upon every single individual and attendee to make sure that our children have the best platform to work from? Man, we could change cities. Change a country. First Chronicles 29, 1 Chronicles 29.1 says, My son Solomon was signed or singled out and chosen by God to do this, but he's young. Solomon was young. He's young and untested, and the work is huge. This is not just a place, hear me, this is not just a place for people to meet each other, but a house for God to meet us. The community is good. The transformation is better. Here's what, where we miss it. David gave Solomon everything he needed to build the temple outside, but he failed to teach Solomon how to defend against what ultimately became his downfall. So as fathers, I'm going to talk about this vulnerability thing again. This, as fathers, there is immeasurable value in a healthy amount of vulnerability with your children. And I say a healthy amount because somebody told me there was a difference between a scar and a wound sometimes, not sometimes, there is a difference between a scar and the wound. And the fact is, is that a scar, you can look at it, it doesn't hurt anymore, but you know it happened, it's there, but it doesn't affect you. So you can grow from it. A wound is still open, it still hurts, it's still visible, it still bleeds and gets on other people. So fathers, I'm saying a healthy amount of vulnerability with your children, because if you haven't overcome it yet, you can't teach others to overcome it. However, opening up that door to your human side is, has immeasurable value in it for your children. So you can be tough dad all you want, but when your child needs to be understood on a sensitive level, it's okay to go there. It's okay to go there. It's quiet in here. It's quiet in here, but I hope it's because it's something sinking in is that we can't grow up with an insensitive generation. Why? Because we have a broken world that we need to heal. And insensitivity against brokenness does nothing. So if we go after the people that we're trying to like, <laughs> are you getting me on this? Is that we can't be so hard and so tough and so courageous that when we go and face brokenness that we don't know how to, humanity, like our, how to allow our humanity to engage in it. So that sensitivity 
It's, it's like a muscle. It needs to be worked. Let it loose with a healthy amount of vulnerability. So as we see in, in Scripture, many of David's downfalls, and, I, and I, I say a downfall because he was King David. You see the Psalms, like big book of David going up in highs and lows, very emotional man. But one of his downfalls was when it ultimately came to women. He had an issue. If you look throughout the history, like when he defeats Goliath, why does he get Mikhail, the princess? Because he heard there was a princess of. So Mikhail was a trophy wife to him because he defeated Goliath. When you think about Bathsheba bathing on the roof, can you imagine? Like, this is what's cool about this. Is, it's not cool. But Solomon is actually the son of Bathsheba. So when David has his encounter with Bathsheba and then goes kills Bathsheba's husband, Husband, Solomon, is that so? Can you imagine that father son conversation where Solomon's, hey, dad, tell me about my mom? He's like, well, I saw her bathing on a roof. I went and killed her husband, covered it all up. We're good, you're born, you're here. It's good. Really sensitive, yeah. Point being, Point being, David had an issue with women. And I'm going to get to the scripture in a moment, but you're going to see that if David would have just taken the moment to sit down and instead of being like, here's the blueprints for how you build a palace and been to Solomon, here's the blueprints for how you defend your heart and protect it and see people as value and understand the worth in a human being and not allow your, em your emotions to get the better of you. Can you imagine like how much longer Solomon's reign could have been? First Kings 11.3 says, <laughs> Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. Do you remember David's, David's talk with Solomon? Keep your heart focused on God. And as Solomon gets richer and more influential, 700 wives, 300 concubines... For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father, David. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to broaden the scope here. I'm not just talking about women, but gentlemen, fathers, young and old. The failure to teach practices without purposes, we'll leave our next generation defenseless. So if we go to church with our children and they stand here and they sing songs about overcoming and victory, but they don't understand that worship is their weapon and they can tap into it when they feel overwhelmed or anxious, then they will come to church and they will sing songs about victory without ever experiencing the victory. We can teach our kids about money and finances and, and RSPs and getting it all set up well and everything, but if we don't teach them that everything that we have comes from God and that we give generously back to God because it's not ours anyways and that's actually a defense mechanism against greed in our heart, then they will have riches and wealth, but they won't know how to spend it and they won't know how to handle the greed when it comes to it. So our failure at fathers to, pre to teach practices without the purposes of why we do them is going to leave them defenseless. Amen? And if you walk away, apart from the take, if you walk away with something today, is that we have to prepare the child for the path and not the path for the child. So it's, it's looking at our children and being like, I know what's going to trip you up in your future. Here's how I'm going to help prepare you for it. Instead of being like, here's your path. Go for it. And we'll find out what comes at the other end. Like, do you, fathers, do you hear me today? Is that we have to be intentional. Let's set up not just a really, really good success mechanism for them so they have a house and they're financially secured and they have their 401ks if you're in the States, but let's set up how teach our children how to fight against temptation we have a whole generation growing up that's finding a whole lot of fulfillment over the screen. T 
Tinder, TikTok, whatever you want to call it. We have a whole generation that's growing up thinking that they can find love on the other side of their iPhone. And it's a filtered, watered down, very bare version of what love is. Barely even significant. So fathers, dads, men, what if you were to take the things that you hide from God, the struggles that you mentally, emotionally, spiritually deal with, and you were to go and wrestle them with God and be like, God, I need, I need healing in this. I need freedom in this. I don't know what it is that's weighing me down, whether it's my insecurities or whether it's that I keep tripping over the same temptation over and over again. Fathers, what if we were to, men, what if we were to, boys, young men, youth, what if we were to really take those things and lay them down and be like, God, I know I can't move forward until that's dealt with. Because I don't want my kids to deal with that. I don't want that to be the culture of my home. I don't want the enemy to have a foothold in my home because of what I choose to watch or what I choose to put in my ears or what I listen to. Like, fathers, what if we were to set up not just a physical temple, but we taught our kids how to build a fortress, a fortitude, faith-filled fortress for their lives, that the spiritual enemy has no foothold in their lives, that they can grow up, find a significant other, grow wealthy with kids, and have a very healthy sense of what God has in store for them. Could we do that? Can you imagine a church of thousands of people where the next generation is rising up, they understand who their God is, they're well prepared in a spiritual sense, and they're ready to tackle the battles that we have ahead of us. What would our cities look like? What's in the garage that is still broken? What's that unfinished project that God has been working in your heart and he hasn't, there hasn't, it's, it's in the garage because either you've put it on hold or you've ignored it. Because when that garage door lifts, check. When that garage door lifts and your legacy is about to get handed down, your kids are going to get both the good and the bad. They're going to get it both. And it'd be really good to go in and do an inventory of that garage and be like, I don't want my kids stepping on this broken glass. I don't want my kids tripping over this broken board. Let's leave a legacy that sets them up where their ceiling is like here and the city stands back. It's like, what happened to these kids? Because they are like, they're employed. They're in leadership. They are making wide decisions on a national, like, you get me? You get me, church? Like, let's just put it away and deal with it. Let's just deal with it. The takeaway today is this, is that the freedom that fathers seek is the rest their children will find. If you as a father are willing to seek, and in seeking is not easy. It's not free either. Coretta King Scott says this, is that freedom is never really won. It has to be fought for with every generation. So, as a man, as a young man, as an old man, whatever that freedom is that you're searching for, if you, are, if you would be willing to fight to seek it out and get at peace with who you are and live freely from bondage, whatever slavery you feel that you keep, keep, calling, like, keep getting called back to and you keep tripling over yourself as a father, you are not a failure as a father, you are a human trying to make it through life. But what if you were to take that and just lay it down and be like, God, I need you to deal with this because I care, I care about my kids more than I care about the temporary satisfaction, whatever. I care about my kids' future more than I care about this. What if you were to get to that point? Dads, what would your home look like? And even more valuable, how could your kids see you if you would just open up with a healthy amount of vulnerability. They see you going to work. They see you coming home. They see you cutting the lawn. They see you loving on their mom and, and, and cooking and, and, and you're doing all the right things. But there's something about vulnerability that can't be just caught out of the air. Your kids aren't going to catch it. Like, you need to display it and be willing to display it. Like with my son, I've recently been working on him 
working with him in regards to like just getting to the point where you apologize. He's young, but I'm like, this is, this is when you apologize as a man, it means you've brought yourself down to a level playing field. It's like you can be strong and courageous and I can teach him superhero things and everything like that, but if I don't teach him how to like get to the, to the center of his heart when, the, when it matters the most, man, I feel like he'd be missing out on something that would trickle down to his kids. And fathers, if you seek that freedom, man, we, we serve a heavenly father. And if you don't know how to tackle those issues in your heart, if you don't know how to get there, our heavenly father has a way of, it says, he seeks, he knows all thoughts, all, all thoughts intents. There's nothing we're hiding here. And I'm not asking you to be vulnerable here either, but you have an opportunity to have a heavenly father. And I want to go there and I'm running way over, but I wanted to say this one more thing. If you are a dad in here, and maybe circumstances in life have displaced you out of your father position, I want you to know that you still have a place in God's church. That you are not an outcast. That you're not pushed out or that you're not looked down upon. Circumstances happen in life, but the calling on your life to God's big C church, it may not be this church, it may not be another church, but God's big C church, you still have a calling on your life. So I hope that puts some dads at ease because I know circumstances can be hard and I'm not, I'm not, how would I say it? I'm not naive to the fact that that, could, that situation could be very well in this environment. But you still have a place, and we have a generation growing up that needs fathers. When I look at Paul and Timothy, Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy, but Paul didn't have any kids of his own. So that tells me that fatherhood is a spirit. It's not a natural position. You can have a spirit of fatherhood be like, I need to help somebody. I want to help somebody. I want to protect somebody. I want to support somebody. There's no better place than God's church to do that. Amen? I just want to pray with you guys. God, we thank you for every father in this room. We thank you for the sacrifices that are made. God, we thank you that you reveal right now, God, what's in the garage. God, I pray you pull out the broken pieces. God, reveal them today. And if there's anybody in this room that doesn't know their heavenly father, today is a really good opportunity to understand that you're not fatherless in this world. Would you repeat after me? Say, heavenly father. I thank you that you've watched me, you've loved me, forgiven me, even when I didn't deserve it. I ask you today to come into my life, be the Lord of my life, my Savior and my friend. Thank you that you've never left me and that my past is past and I can be used by you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.